Welcome once again to the Friday Night Study. Pastor Wayne Hathaway here with you. And I thought maybe just uh, for a, a little bit, just a brief introduction of myself for maybe those who are new to the study. Uh, Pastor Calvary Chapel here in Billings, Montana for uh, 25 years and retired just a couple of years ago. And about a year and a half ago began uh, daily, some good seeds, uh, daily devotional, and then uh, really felt impressed uh, early on that I wanted to spend more time in the book of Romans. So I began to study and the result of that became the Friday night study. And so uh, we're studying in the book of Romans. We've been there uh, since the 1st of January of 2021 and now uh, all the way to chapter five. And so I'm just so thankful for the opportunity to teach God's word and pray that it will be a blessing to you. Our study uh, again tonight is in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and I invite you to grab your Bibles and follow along. We have a number of scriptures that we'll be referring to as we go through, and so uh, join with me as we study God's Word. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, I think we ought to read that once again just to get the context. So here's Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we come now to this third result and consequence of justification by faith, which the Apostle Paul is emphasizing, namely the words that are found in that last phrase of verse 2, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This is just such a wonderful study, and I pray that it'll be a blessing to you. So we we previously looked at the first result, which was acceptance. Uh, 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 be, having been justified by faith, we have acceptance with uh, get, that brings peace with God. Such a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, and then we also discussed the second element of that was access, access into the grace in which we stand, and, and reviewed that. And you can, as I said, you could go back at some good seeds and review those if you wanted to look at those and, and came uh, if you haven't uh, heard those messages and bring you up to speed but these are all standalone messages and pray that it'll be a blessing so so uh, paul speaks of what that meant to us or what that means to us and so now we have again as we've done previously come once more to the, and the first thing that we need to do is understand uh, to bring out to dis, uh, uh, discover what the full meaning of the words that we have before us, uh, what the full meaning is. And so I want to begin just with this word rejoice, because uh, it's such a great word here in the text. It's it's the right word, but I, as I've read and studied, it seems like it's a little uh, inadequate in the translation, not that I am some kind of an expert to do that, but, but it, it seems like it's not quite strong enough. Uh, rejoice is a good word, but there is a little more to it. And the apostle uses that word uh, that is generally translated in, in, in the scriptures everywhere as, as boast or to glory. For example, uh, the statement that is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 31, where he says, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Same, same word that's used here. But it's more than rejoicing. It, it, it carries with it the element of boasting. Now, obviously, a man who boasts does rejoice, but a man may rejoice without really boasting. What the apostles concerned to say here is that because of this doctrine of justification by faith, because of our faith in him whom God has delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification, because of that justification, we boast, we exult, we glory in this, this hope of the glory of God. And this is such an important element for us. This word used here carries the idea uh, 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 as a part of this essential meaning. It means to, well, to congratulate oneself. Uh, you congratulate, congratulate yourself, not for, not for anything that you have done, but for something that you have received, some favor that has been shown to us, that you congratulate, congratulate yourself on it, and then you boast about it, you exult in it, and glory in it. And that's the word that the apostle is using here. And it's important that we should have the full, uh, the full weight and meaning because it's a very special part of Paul's argument at this point that he has been going through through the first four chapters and now introducing us into this fifth chapter. This word is one of the most uh, characteristic of, of the apostles, of the apostle Paul's literary, uh, literary style. It, uh, 
it's a you could even say maybe it's one of his favorite words and and i agree with those who suggest that it's a word which tells us really a great deal about the apostle paul's character and his temperament um, he was a man who always gloried in what he believed and he had done so before he was converted you remember when he was a uh, 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 not a Christian. He didn't do things half-heartedly. Never was he like that when he persecuted the church. He did it with everything in his might, everything that he has consisted of. And in the day when he thought his righteousness that at that time, he thought his righteousness after the law, that he was blameless. And so he was this Pharisee of the Pharisees. And in a couple of places, he talks about his pedigree, if you will. But it's certain, therefore, that he is He's not going to use a weaker term when he's talking about his walk in relationship with the Lord than he used when he was not a Christian. He used to boast of his own righteousness. Now, now he boasts of his position in Christ and he boasts and exalts in the glory of God to which he now looks forward to in hope. He's talking about hoping in the glory of God which is to come. That brings us to the question, what does he mean by glorying in the hope of the glory of God? He's looking forward to it with confidence. He's looking forward to it with assurance. The very prospect of it is something that thrills him to his very core, to his very being. That makes it, uh, I, I think it makes it incumbent upon us to inquire exactly what he means by this and why it was so important. And that prompts a question that I want to ask. So here we are. We're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that we are justified by faith. And here's kind of what Paul says then. Very well, if you realize what you're saying, you should be boasting in the hope of the glory of God. So the question is, are we? Are we boasting in that? Are we doing so? But what, what does that mean to us? What is it to glory in or to boast in the hope of the glory of God? So two things that I want to emphasize from these three verses uh, or from these, uh, yeah, from these verses. The, first of all, the forward look, and then I want to talk about the functional look. They, the, these are these are vital, I believe, to our daily walk in our relationship with the Lord. So, first of all, I want to look at the forward look. Well, let's look at the meaning. We already looked at the meaning of the word rejoice and what that means. But first of all, what it, here, what he's talking about? He means that he is looking forward in a spirit of exultation and joy and of pride to seeing the glory of God. So this is the forward look. He's looking forward to that. Now remember, the words of Jesus, for example, in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 6, what did he say? Blessed are the pure in heart, what? For they shall see God. It means what it says. They shall see God. This rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God includes that. The apostle was looking forward to that. Uh, the, the What some theologians call, I love this, this is kind of a cool term, the beatific vision. Uh, never have heard that word before until I read it in a, in a, in a commentary. Uh, but what it's talking about basically is the vision of God. This is the ultimate end of our faith. This is the final goal of it all. The real object of redemption and of salvation is to bring us eventually to that place where we will stand and behold the glory of God, the vision, the beatific vision of God. The expression also means that we look forward to seeing the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself expressed his desire for us to see, for his his own people, for us to see him in all of his glory. In his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verse 24, here's what he said. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. You remember how at the beginning of that prayer, here's what he said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should have, give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth, I have finished the work which you have given me to do, and now, O oh Father, Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And at the end of the prayer, he prays that we, his people, may see that glory. 
So the apostle had not only seen him in the form of a servant in the days of his humiliation, and he desires that they may see him as he truly is, sharing in the eternal glory with his father. So the guys had seen him somewhat, knew a little bit about that, but Jesus's prayer is that they would see him, not only believe him, but to see him in all of his glory. Not only the apostles, but all who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Apostle Paul was looking forward to beholding this full glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says that all Christians should do that because of the fact that we have been justified by faith. Oh, that is so wonderful to consider. So we should not only look forward to it, but we should make our boast in this prospect to exalt, to glory in, that is to feel or show triumphant elation or jubilation at the prospect of it. So there is a, I think there is a valid reason why he must, why Paul uses such expression like this, because as we know, he had already had a little bit of a glimpse of that. He, he was, he was not the only one who had had that kind of a glimpse. Take Stephen, for example, which the apostle Paul may well have witnessed. We know from the Acts when, when he was holding the cloaks or guarding the coats of the people who were stoning Stephen. And you remember Stephen there, and said, I see the, see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, and they, they uh, grind their teeth at him. Uh, but you remember that we're told about Stephen in Acts chapter 7, verse 25, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What a tremendous statement. Here, here is a man who is a... Here is a man who is about to be or is in the process of being stoned to death with his enemies, gnashing their teeth at him and doing their worst. And, and all hell, as it were, were being loosed upon him. But God doesn't forget him. And what Stephen was most conscious of was not the, mal uh, the malignity of their hatred and all of, his, of the stuff of his enemies or the suffering or even death. But he was, he was looking at the, with excitement at the sight of the glory of God, the beatific vision, if you will. But the Apostle Paul himself knew what he was writing about when he said these words. You remember what happened to him on the road to Damascus. There he was going along, as Acts tells us, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, when suddenly he saw a light in the heavens that was brighter than the shining of the sun. We know something of looking ourselves into the face of the sun and we read today in our newspapers about flash we've seen in the history accounts of the of the explosion of, of the hydrogen bomb and the flash that is so bright it blinds you if you see it uh and so but but he but here paul is he saw the lord jesus christ brighter the face of the one the one who is glorified jesus christ glorified such as he had never seen before and the light was shining that was shining that was emanating from him was brighter than the sun and it blinded him and he uttered a cry who are you lord and back came the reply i am jesus whom you are persecuting it's hard for you to kick against the goads he saw the risen lord of the glory streaming from his face you remember how Peter and John, for example, also had been given a glimpse of this and some insight into it on the Mount of Transfiguration. They had climbed the, mount, uh, the mountain with the Lord in, in Matthew chapter 17, and as they went up there, his appearance was changed uh, not from all that they had previously known, but suddenly they saw him completely transfigured. And he was, as it says in Matthew chapter 17, transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as a light. So what was this transfiguration? It was something of the glory that really belonged to him, coming upon him against that whole situation at that moment, revealing some of that. And then the, it was something that so impacted Peter, James, and John that Peter later wrote in check, in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16, he says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter was amazed at what he saw, and that was what made him say in verse 4, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. I love what how the King James translates that. It says, not knowing what to say, he said. You know, Peter always seemed to be the one who was uh, opening his mouth and inserting his foot. But nonetheless, 
they saw Jesus transfigured there. They saw something of the glory and it impacted their life so much so that he wanted to stay in the glory. But that was not to be for they were only given a glimpse of it, a little foretaste, if you will. The same idea appears in uh, other places in Paul's teaching. For, ex for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, we already see something of this glory, but it's through a glass darkly. It's, it's kind of a, a clouded mirror, a kind of uh, a, a, a enigma, a cloudiness, misshapen. But it's nonetheless something of the glory of, of God. He says that he's looking forward to seeing it, not through a glass darkly, but then he says face to face incredible hope. The ability to even stand in God's presence in that situation is going to be beyond beyond our ability. In fact, we couldn't do it in our present bodies. We need a new body, and we're going to get that. Praise the Lord for that. So further reference to this glory is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. He has been contrasting the believer with the unconverted Jew over whose eyes there is still this veil they can't see so that they can't see the truth of the scripture, which they read every Sabbath. They were acquainted with it in the synagogue. And so the position of the Christian, he says, is entirely different from that. But we all, he says in that passage in 2 Corinthians, with unveiled face, that is, with the veil gone, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We already see something of that, and it's in effect, it is, it is having the effect of changing us from glory to glory. So here he tells us that he's looking forward to the day that is coming when it will not be as in a glass, but in all of its fullness with all of the, uh, the wonder and the glory of that moment. Then there's this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10, in which the Apostle Paul tells that some 14 years before he had a remarkable experience. He cannot tell, he says, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know. God knows. It was so glorious, so marvelous. He came to analyze it and give, uh, he, he, rather, he cannot analyze it, but he, and he can't even give us a detailed description of it. All he knows is that he was caught up into the third heaven, that is, to the place where God dwells. Uh, and he doesn't know how, he, but he heard things which he cannot, he says, I can't even repeat the things that I heard because of their glory and because of their wonder. He was caught up to that place. And so he, he talks a little bit about that, doesn't even refer to it in the first person that it was he himself but yeah, I know a man, he says. So yeah, the, the still alive and still in the body and, and, and though still limited in that way, he was given this sight, this glimpse of the glory and heard something of the language of heaven and, and of eternity and what a glorious experience it was for him. And all this had created within him a deep longing and a desire to see it without any hindrance and to enjoy it forever and forever. I've quoted these passages because it is only the only way in which we can see or have some dim perception of what the apostle is teaching us here. What this passage means then is that to all who are in Christ, to all who are justified by faith, there is coming for certain this beatific vision. We will see the Lord in all of his glory. We will stand in the presence of God and see the glory of God and of Jesus Christ without a veil, no longer a pale reflection in a mirror, but then face to face. That's the hope of the believer. That is the glory. That's what we rejoice in. We glory and we boast in, but it also means something further. And that is that we ourselves are going to be glorified. Yes, Paul saw all that. He spoke about all that. Yes, we we are going to participate, and it's the wonder of that that I want us to get our to get our heads around. It's something that we ourselves are going to be glorified. Oh, we we have this forward look, but we also have a functional look, and that's what this understanding and this look does for it. I call it that because it's what we who know the Lord are looking forward to. It's an essential thing because without it, we would never be fit or able to stand the glory of God, which is going to be revealed to us. And this again is a part of our ultimate salvation. We talk a lot about sanctification, but we don't always hear a lot about glorification. 
We talk about justification. We talk about sanctification, but not a lot of emphasis on glorification. And that's what this passage is all about. Paul is saying, having therefore been justified, uh, 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 having therefore been justified, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access into the grace in which we stand and, and rejoice in the glory of God. So how does that work out? Uh, practically, functionally, the wonder of it all. This is the hope that we have in Christ. So, first of all, let's take a look at the meaning of, at the, meaning of the words. To understand this, we must take a moment to the to look back to the third chapter in this epistle in verse 23, because that's that's the kind of a beginning point. There is showing the need of and introducing the doctrine of justification by faith. He says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It meant that as a result of sin, we have all fallen away from God, that we are not in communion with God, which we should be enjoying, which Adam had before the fall. Adam communed with God directly. God came and spoke to Adam. Adam saw the glory of God. I don't know if in all of its fullness, but nonetheless, he had fellowship, friendship with God, and he had was enjoying that. And ever since then, since the fall, mankind has fallen short of the glory of God. We, have, we were meant for the glory of God, and we were meant to reflect the glory of God. God made man, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, in his own image and likeness, and something of the glory of God was in man. There was a glory about him. Him, but he has lost it, and none of us possesses it because we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we are going to possess the glory again, and that's what the apostle is saying here. He says it again more explicitly in chapter 8, verse 18, where he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which, he shall, which shall be revealed in us. So that not only means that we will see the glory of God revealed in us, but there is a glory of God to be revealed in and through us. In other words, it's a reference to glorification. When? Now. We rejoice in that process now, but it's something that is going to be perfected when we stand before the Lord. So in verse 19, he continues, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. The whole creation is waiting for this manifestation of the glorification of the sons of God. What a great event it is going to be. And look at this. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting. Waiting for what? For the adoption the redemption of our body, this change that is going to take place. What does it mean? It means that the here and now, we are justified. We are being sanctified. We indeed, as Paul has says, the first fruits of the Spirit. But there is one thing that we have not got, one thing we shall never have perfectly in this world, and that is the final redemption of our bodies. Our bodies have suffered as a result of the fall. It was not merely man's spirit which fell. When Adam fell, the whole of man fell. Body, spirit, and soul, our body, mind, and spirit. Our bodies are not what they are meant to be. Our bodies are weak and subject to illness, infection, coughs, colds, aches, pains, cancers, all these things. It's all a result of the fall. And there is not that reality of the original beauty that is left in us. There's a... There's a uh, a shadow of it, a, a, a little sampling of it, but it's not the fullness of it. But when we are glorified, our bodies are going to be perfect. Every vestige of sin will be taken out of them, and all the results and consequences of sin will be entirely removed, done away with. Praise the Lord. There will be no trace of sin left, and every one of us will be glorious in beauty. It's an essential part of the Christian message to preach redemption of the body. That's why we must never let go of the doctrine of the resurrection. What does Paul say? I preach Christ crucified. I preach Christ resurrected. When he talked about it, Marzil, they mocked him 
and ridiculed him because he preached this, preached the resurrection. So we are to be raised and we are to be changed, to be glorified in a moment, Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 15, that in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be glorious in our bodies, even as he is in a glorified body. So that's what Paul saw on the road to Damascus. He had a glimpse of the glorified body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now this, we are promised, is going to happen to us. The Apostle John puts it this way in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, where he says, Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. We haven't seen that yet. We haven't gotten that whole thing yet. But, but, we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's the glorious hope that Paul is talking about. And rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It entails all this that we're talking about. And so what he's telling us in our text is that he's rejoicing in the hope of this. He's going to see God. He is going to see the Lord Jesus Christ without a veil. And he himself is also going to be glorified. In that glorious body, there will be neither spot nor wrinkle nor any such thing. There will be no remnant of sin in, in spirit or in body or in any part of us. We will, be, we will be perfect and entire, glorified in a glorious body in the presence of the God of all glory. Praise the Lord. So if we are in Christ, this is happening to us right now. We are being changed into the image of the Lord. But what does that mean to us right now? It means that, in, that, that, that a seed of the divine life has been planted in us. We've been born again, and this principle of eternal life has been put into us. We have been created anew into the image of God's dear Son. We are being created in righteousness and true holiness. That's what is taking place. That is already happening to us. If we have the life of Christ in us, something of his glory is in us. It may be very small, but we are being changed from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That's what, that's what the purpose, dear ones, of being in the Word is all about, so that our lives are changed. We are exposed to the glory of God through His Word, and His Word has an impact in our hearts and lives, so that we are changed, so that we are being made more and more. Those whom He foreknew, He did predestine to be uh, to be like him. That's the purpose of it, so that we're changed from glory of glory. So the glorification has already started, and we must not, in our thinking, postpone it entirely into the next world. That's the functional part that we're talking about. It's going on right now. It's because of this that we who are Christian people should, I think, uh, I don't know if ashamed is the right word, but nonetheless, we aren't what we should be. And we, there is more to it than what we are experiencing. So God wants to bring us deeper and deeper in our walk and our relationship for <clears throat> with him so that what is taking place as we understand the process and what is taking place, that we rejoice in that because we know something that is so important. How do we know it? We know it through the word that there is this process that is taking place. Even the trials and the truth, and he's going to talk about this, Paul is in beginning in verse three that we'll get into later. But it's just, we rejoice in these things because we know something and it's that hope that we have. So let us go on to that which is available to us. Let's not be satisfied. Let's not be sitting in a position where, okay, we're going to heaven and we're glad for that. No, let's continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. We seem to, sometimes we seem to just kind of glory what we have here and what we are uh, less, uh, less than other people who don't know Jesus. Uh, and we just kind of relax in that. Listen, we have all these blessings in Christ in the germ the seed of glorification is in us right now, as certainly as our sanctification and as certainly as our justification in him. It's our union with Christ that guarantees everything. That's why the apostle tells us in, in, the, in the letter to the church at Ephesus, we are already seated with him in the heavenly places. That's why we must learn to make our boast in these things, to glory in. That's why I've taken so much time in these two verses. I must ask us again, do we have this peace with God? Are we really standing in the grace as a child of God? Do we know the confidence 
to the, or, or know with confidence? Do we come with confidence to the throne of grace and pray with a holy boldness? Are we rejoicing in the glory of God? There must be no uncertainty about these things. There, this isn't just hope as the world experiences. Don't be misled by the word hope. There is power in this. As the apostle uses the word, he means something which is absolutely certain. It is the blessed hope, the hope that is set before us in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 through 20, which he says, as it, the hope that we have as an anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus. So let us be certain about these things and lay hold of them. They are things that are inevitable because of being justified by faith. So let me ask again, are you boasting? Are you exulting and glorying in the hope of the glory of God? If not, then I, if you would like to, listen, I can give you a prescription as to how that can become possible for us. Look at first, or Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far exceeding, the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For even the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I can say these things that are happening are a light affliction, but for a moment, says Paul, while as long as I look not at what is around me, but I get, because if you do that, you get carried away because you miss all of that. As long as I look into his, his face, it's a glass darkly. As long as I see the glory there, that glory that awaits me, everything else then becomes light affliction. For exactly the same reason, he says in writing to the Colossians in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. I'm talking about a prescription that will help us to move forward in that. If we've not seen something of the glory of God and of Christ in it because we are looking so many times, too much at other things, spending too much time with social media or reading the newspaper, watching TV, letting the world influence more us, letting the world influence us more than we realize. Oh, may the Lord help us to turn away from it all and begin to look at, to gaze upon the things that are not seen, the things which are eternal, that to glory, to exalt in them, to set our affections there. It calls for an effort of the will. It calls for discipline for in our lives, friends. It, it means diligence in our study of the scriptures and meditation upon them. Seek him there. Ask the spirit to reveal himself to you. Ask him to manifest himself to you as we gain a clearer and more precise vision of him and the glory that awaits us, then we will be very ready to join Paul and say, we boast and we glory and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Amen. Amen. I pray that this will stir our hearts to, to do this more and more, that it will help us to have a clearer vision of what God has in store for us and that we will look past the stuff of this life to the things that are before and have our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord richly bless you today. And if, you, if you've never known that, if you've not even listened to this and you, you don't know for sure that you have that hope, friends, you can do that by recognizing your need realizing that you are a sinner in need of God's grace and repent of your sin and ask God to forgive you and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you will have that same hope. Praise the Lord for that. May the Lord richly bless you today as you walk with him. Amen.